now's the time to challenge your status quo. It's the time to not look in the rear view mirror and instead look in the front facing windshield and think about what needs to change. Change takes a long time in the ecosystem, the megacosm, in the channel, whatever you want to call it. Change takes time. Welcome to the Ultimate Guide to Partnering. In this podcast, Vince Mincione, a proven industry sales and partner executive, brings together technology leaders to discuss transformational trends and to deconstruct successful strategies to thrive and survive in the rapid age of cloud transformation. And now your host, Vince Mincione. Welcome to, or welcome back to the Ultimate Guide to Partnering where technology leaders come to optimize results through successful partnering. I'm Vince Menzion, your host, and my mission is to help leaders like you unlock the leadership principles and learnings of the best in the business to get partnerships right, optimize for success, and deliver your greatest results. A channel ecosystem and megacosm icon takes us on a masterclass to optimizing your greatest results partnering. For this next episode of Ultimate Guide to Partnering, I was so excited to welcome Janet Schein, the CEO of JS Group, and a person who's been a leader in the channel for many years. Janet and I have a tremendous conversation on principles of success and coaching she is giving to organizations and how to achieve your greatest results through ecosystems and megacosms. This is a must-listen episode. And I hope you enjoy this amazing conversation as much as I enjoyed welcoming Janet Shine. Before we dive into the interview, I'm happy to announce that PartnerTap has become a founding sponsor of Ultimate Guide to Partnering. PartnerTap is the only partner ecosystem platform designed for the enterprise. Their technology makes it easy to align channel teams with automated account mapping, letting you control what data you share while building a partner revenue engine. Janet, welcome to the podcast. Hey, great to be here. I am so excited to finally welcome you as a guest on Ultimate Guide to Partnering. You are an icon in this world of partnerships, channels, and ecosystems. And your name comes up all the time in conversations. You're the CEO of your own successful organization. You've been a channel chief at some very major tech companies. So I am really excited for this conversation today. So am I really excited. So for the one or two of our listeners who might not know Janet, can you tell us a little bit more about you? Yes. And if you don't know me, for goodness sakes, connect with me on LinkedIn or something so that we get to know each other. I pride myself on knowing everyone in the industry. So if it's not true, I'll be brokenhearted. I, as you mentioned, have been the channel chief at some major companies. Verizon is a good example, Motorola Enterprise and a senior leader at some Fortune 500 companies, including Office Depot. And my claim to fame has always been around the successful creation of what back in the day was partnerships, today is ecosystems, and is currently moving towards what I can only call a megacosm. Myself and the team at JS Group are all people who have carried the bag, done the work, been there, been held responsible by the board or the operating committee or the CEO or the CFO and understand what is a good go-to-market, both direct and indirect. How do those two survive and live together in the world? What's the true role of a good, healthy partnership? And how does a partner experience drive growth for uh, companies? We also understand the partner side of the business and work exclusively with many of the top partners in the industry to help them go and get the demand that all the vendors want them to get. And in fact, uh, just in 2021 alone, we developed more than $1.4 billion in revenue working with partners in partner marketing programs. We really feel that we're, we've got our finger on the pulse in the channel that the vendors, suppliers, carriers, whatever you want to call yourselves today, know as well as the one the partners know. And many times they're not the same channel. So we pride ourselves on being able to bring those two viewpoints together and get progress for both sides of the house. Partnerships are two organizations coming together coming from opposite sides often. And I love what you have to say in particular about having carried the bag, been in the hard conversations at the board and executive level. Because I think that many people miss that, that this isn't always easy street and partnerships can be hard at times. It's hard and, and harder when, especially in today's environment, 
You've got investors who have put money in and are demanding certain growth and many times are asking to do things that are not good for the long-term success of your channel partners. And so that's why JS Group has a mission. And we have a very simple three-word mission statement, and it's save the channel. So in everything we do, we really focus on is what we're doing good for the channel as well as good for vendor, distributor, supplier, et cetera. And many times you get leaders, particularly if you've carried the bag for this, you're probably nodding along right now. You get leaders in the company. I don't want to pick on the CFOs, but a lot of times it's the CFO or it's a big consulting firm, right? The PwC, Accenture's, Deloitte's of the world who have put something on a spreadsheet or a slide that sounds so simple, reduce the cost to channel, lower commissions, cut unproductive partners, et cetera, et cetera. It sounds so simple. And in the channel, the simple answer is always wrong. That person who's carrying the bag, who's the channel leader, who's the channel chief is just constantly facing this battering. And I don't know that the partners always realize that. They're constantly facing this battering from someone in the company who believes that they have a way that could improve their cost or improve performance that may or may not be valid. And so I used to laugh that I was like a human umbrella, that my number one role when I was at Verizon was I had this huge umbrella and that my job was to keep all the bullshit from coming down and actually hitting the channel. And that's the reality. It's a hard job. It is a really hard job. And you reminded me of that CFO conversation. It's so funny that the point of view that they often have, it's almost like an appendage to the organization. It's not integrated in the organization. Yes. That lack of commitment. Like, How do you help organizations get over that lack of commitment? It's amazing. It's such a great question. And I just had what could only be referred to as a polite argument with an organization just last week. And one of the things that's really interesting is You have these senior leaders who have, for their company at least, been able to bend the will of a market. Many of them have been creators, founders, or they are from early on. And so they believe that they can bend the will of the channel. And so that's the first hurdle I have to get over when I'm trying to convince a senior leader that perhaps their view of the channel is a misguided one. So the first thing is to say, look, I cannot change what the norm is in the channel. And neither can you. And you can grouse about it, complain about it, be upset about it. I'm going to show you why it actually works. I'm going to show you why the numbers that you put together may not be fully reflective of the true costs of each route to market. And we're going to talk about what the most logical routes to market are and what changes you can make within the confines of what the real operating model of a channel is. And a lot of times that helps people to start to think, oh, So in other words, two things can exist in complete disagreement. You can be unhappy about, for example, how much you have to pay in commission in an agent channel or discount in a resale channel. But if that's the percentage that's being done in the industry right now, and you don't have a differentiator that's above and beyond that causes people to be okay taking less money because maybe they make services, et cetera, you have to come first to that reality that you can't change the fabric of the channel by yourself. Yeah. Bending the will, it comes up in so many ways too, right? Not just there, but also with organizations. I work a lot with ISV organizations and they're trying to make their impact working with the hyperscalers like Microsoft, yep. Google, and Amazon. And they think because they built the better mousetrap that they should just run to their door. And they don't understand that those organizations have their own set of objectives and compensation models. And That's right. Playing, and the better mousetrap often never even gets it in the cart. Exactly. It's just the reality. They have their own organizations, their own mores, their own rules. Quite frankly, there's what, a couple hundred thousand ISVs moving to a million ISVs if we listen to our research from our dear friend, Jay McBain. Yes. And so with a million variations, there's only so many things I, the channel, whether I'm a hyperscaler part of that ecosystem or whether I'm a down market partner, there's only so much I can sell anyway or put on my platform or promote or care about. And so that arrogance that, oh, I'm the one you're going to pick is often very misguided. You bring up our good friend, Jay McBain, and I was going to yeah. ask you a little bit about some of the trends. And Jay was just on recently. He's a five-timer now on Ultimate Guide to Partnering. He's getting a robe. And hopefully we'll have you here five times too. You can join yeah, the Yeah, I want a robe. Absolutely. Yeah. I'd love that. When you come back down here to Florida, we'll do that. But I'd love your view on some of these trends. I just had recently had one of Microsoft's 
ISB ecosystem leaders on talking. We talked about the 180,000 going to a million ISVs and how do you support that? But what are some of the trends you've been seeing? The first trend I'll, I always talk about is that there's always news that the channel's in trouble, struggling, whatever, whatever. It's always wrong. So the first thing I always like to say when I talk about trends is the channel route to market is still a very viable one, right? It's still the majority of how tech companies go to market. And that's an important trend because you do hear some rumble in the ISB and hyperscaler space, particularly that, hey, maybe the channel won't be as relevant. And so I think it's just an evolution of what channel will be relevant as opposed to kind of a wholesale, oh, we won't need them anymore. And everybody's just going to click to buy because that's not true. And so I always want to start my trend by saying any rumors of the channel's demise have been greatly exaggerated. The channel is a very viable route to market. The way that you look at your route to market, sell through, sell to, sell with, needs to evolve to understand that we're moving from what was a channel to an ecosystem to a megacosm. And if you look at the definition of a megacosm, a megacosm is multiple microcosms operating in a way that is mutually beneficial to the megacosm. And that's where we're at. Clients are going to have hundreds of softwares, hundreds of kinds of devices, endpoint units, millions of connections. And in that megacosm of their technology, they're going to need multi-threaded partners who are able to, if you will, almost dance together in tempo to make sure that their technology works for them. So that's kind of the first big trend I'm seeing is this trend of the need for mutually beneficial partnerships. And you might say, well, we've always had that. That's not a trend. It's not true. It has been a very adversarial, very, in many instances, very siloed, right? The channel chief loves their partners, but not so sure about the rest of the org, how they feel about the partners. So that's the first thing that, that careful integration, that, that belief that your what you're doing in the megacosm along with everyone else is going to benefit ultimately the end user customer and doing it in a way that has a positive outcome. That's the first big trend I'm seeing. And it's really changing how people are looking at their partner programs so that in that world, then a tiered program that has evolved to say the more you sell, the more rewards we'll give you. Heck, we'll even hide you from the cops if you're selling enough. That falls, that triangle falls, completely implodes in the world that we're in because it needs to be more about the functionality of the relationship and not so much about the rear view metrics of certification or revenue or others. So that that's kind of that first mega trend I'm seeing. I want to comment here, if you don't mind. I see this all the times in organizations where you have the channel organization and the alliances organization for the same company, not reporting in through the same lines up to the CEO and almost competing for resources. Yes. And so you hit a really strong point for me in terms of what I see in organizations as well. And they're not cohesive in terms of going after the market. They're not. They don't get it. And they somehow have decided that even if direct sales is a smaller portion of how they go to market, direct sales is somehow preferential, somehow better, somehow theirs. And the channel is not theirs. And this this idea of owner possessiveness in the ecosystem, I think it's a big red flag that those are the folks you don't want to work with. And those antiquated approaches to how you think about the channel are really backwards. In fact, we just launched a program with a, a vendor. I have an NDA, so I can't say who it is, but we are launching a program with them and the direct team will have to register their deals and have them approved by the channel team. I love it. I love right. it. Right. As opposed to the channel team being approved by the direct team, some person who's out of college for two years is somehow saying, no, that's my account when the partner's been with the account for 35 years. So they're going to flip that one around. They want to be primarily channel centric. If you want to be primarily channel centric, then channels your lead in sales and they should be approving your deals and deciding who they want to work with. And so it's going to be, I think it's going to be a bit of a, of an implosion internally for them to push that through, but that's been our recommendation. And that's the kinds of trends I'm seeing. The other trend I'm seeing, which I do want to talk about is Marketing is now eating sales and in the channel proper, right? Because the channel did start. Now we have this channel where the channel has influence and non-transacting, right? This megacosm has grown. But the original intent of the channel that still runs a thread through this megacosm is sales, is revenue, right? It is closing deals. And in the past, 
what the channel brought that made them valuable was a, a sales prowess, right? An ability to either get in front of a customer or they had the customer, had a relationship with whoever at the customer that they went to school with or whatever. But now we're seeing a world because of digital, because of so much being done hybrid, virtual, remote, we're seeing a world now where marketing just eats sales. And so the partners who have for a long time lived on that prowess of their salespeople quickly starting to have problems. And we're seeing vendors, ISVs, everybody in the megacosm that distributes something, a solution down, they're making excuses for partners. They're saying, oh, this is happening or that's happening. And the reality is what's happening is those partners are being outmarketed. That vendor, that ISV is being outmarketed. And in a world where we have digital natives now as a large portion of our employees and staff and decision makers, that's the biggest trend I see coming is this concept of how do you really help and invest and make sure that your partners are genius marketers and that you're not replaced by someone who is with a different solution. Yeah, it's all on the influence strategy, right? I'm listening to the five seats at the table. I'm getting influenced by various forms of digital marketing, in fact. Right. To your point, if you're not doing it right to influence me, I'm going someplace else. The hugs and mugs that have long been a cornerstone of the channel, they just don't work now, right? It's different now. It's changed now. And so when we're looking at partners and saying for a vendor or supplier, who's the best partner, we're looking at things like, worth of web and we're going out and we're saying how much is their website value grown in the last three years oh it hasn't it's declined well guess what this is a partner who is a risk for you to invest in unless you help them fix their website their search engine optimization their social selling their digital marketing they're a risk because in this digitized age your worth of your website should not be declining it's a red flag and so we're really working with not only existing programs, but new programs to redefine what a good partner looks like. And one of those traits of a good partner in this environment that we're in is this capability to do digital marketing, influence, social selling, to be able to meet customers where they are, which is on the glowing rectangle, their screen. Exactly. I'm so excited to welcome Athletic Greens as the latest sponsor to Ultimate Guide to Partnering. Friends who know me well know I've made taking a green drink supplement part of my health ritual for over 20 years now, and it has made all the difference to my health and well-being. About five years ago, I added Athletic Greens, and now their product, AG1, has become my go-to green drink supplement. I take this literally every single day. AG1 is packed with 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, Whole food source superfoods, probiotics, and aptogens. If you'd like to give AG1 a try, Athletic Greens is giving away a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five travel packs with every new purchase. Check them out at athleticgreens.com forward slash Vince M. So talk to me about influence because some people believe that influence will drive, no transaction will no longer be a play and it's all going to be about influence. What do you think there? I think that's a yes and a no. I think that more and more this because of this concept again of the megacosm, right? Where you have multiple parties, they all have a role to play and their goal is to have a beneficial outcome for the client, the industry, right? Whatever project they're working on. I think in that role, someone has to sell. So influence is going to be masterfully important. And we, we only have to think about one specific influence to see this. So the influence now that the marketing technology firms that sell e-commerce, work on websites, do email marketing, search engine optimization, search engine marketing, et cetera, the influence that they have on the technology purchases of their clients has risen massively, right? Brick and mortar is declining. Website traffic is increasing. Digital commerce is increasing. The provider who does your digital commerce is a major influencer for which technology you pick. They're going to help pick what contact center you have, right? They're going to help pick the speed of your network that you need. Collaboration tools, they're going to be a big influencer. They're likely not going to sell it, 
right? Because they have a different thing they do. They're creative, they're digital. But we're seeing that sphere of influence very important. We're also seeing the sphere of influence of who people read, talk to, listen to by industry. Think of John Nosta. I'll use him as my example. John Nosta in the healthcare industry, right? He he is he's the guy everybody listens to about technology in the healthcare industry. He's phenomenal. If you don't follow him, all of you should look him up. He's a major influencer and his voice right around trends, around the right technology, et cetera. It's not like a Beyonce shampoo influence, right? We're not talking about a paid ad placement. We're talking about the education of those influencers to understand your solutions and understand what you're doing. You may very well pay them for some level of engagement with you to understand that, but using that and using that influence is massive and finding those people that are the influencers for your ultimate customer segment. That's the game. And I think finally, many channel chiefs, many CEOs of channel firms, et cetera, all think that they don't need to have that kind of influence. Somebody in their company can run social media and it'll be fine. And they could not be further from the truth. Your voice, what you say and do online, your digital footprint is really important, not just to your channel or your customers, but also to your internal employees who 75% are millennial or Gen Z right now in quote unquote corporate America, that's where they consume their ideas, their news, their thoughts. And so if you're not an influencer there, you're going to lose that stickiness in your culture that makes people want to follow you as a leader. And so we're working a lot at JS Group. We have a social influence program. We train people how to do social selling, how to stand up the right persona, And for many people, we actually do that for them. We do that work for those senior leaders. We've had a lot of influencer of the year winners who have been our clients. And so we've got a little secret sauce there, but it is something that leaders have to concentrate on as well. It's not just for your marketing team. So important. So often the CEO and the executive team hides behind the corporate brand and lets that be the voice of the company. And I see it from the best, the best CEOs. And I'll use an example, a good friend of mine, Tony Savoyan, the CEO of Sada Systems. He's out in front. He's out in front of some controversial topics sometimes. He's also talking about what's happening in the economy and how he's treating his employees. And he's projecting this out to the entire ecosystem through LinkedIn, Twitter, and other channels. Right. And to right. Me, that's that's the way you want to be today in today's environment. That is exactly how you want to be. And that's how new leaders get tapped too, right? They're like if people are not Broadway play aficionados, I apologize for this, but there's a scene in Wicked, which is kind of a famous Broadway play. And the scene is about what was the most common thing that all the leaders in the past have had in common. And one person says, oh, is it they were smart or they were t- talented? And the singer says, no, they were popular. And I think we sometimes as geeks in the tech industry forget that concept. They were popular. And so what he's doing, right, what the Sada System CEO is doing is having a view, having a point of view. It doesn't need to be necessarily wildly controversial, but having a point of view, standing his ground, standing for things, talking, right, in a human voice, not in corporate speak really makes all the difference. And those are the kinds of leaders that are popular and that people follow. And I see folks like Heather Murray, who just is is a great influencer for women in the tech industry, right? That level of influence, that level of leadership, that, that can't be, that really and truly cannot be duplicated. So important. So important here. You've touched on a couple of great points here, but what other things do you think makes a great partnership organization or ecosystem strategy? For an organization? I think so. A couple of things. The first one is talent does matter. So having the best channel leader that your ecosystem leader, whatever you want to call them, that you can afford is really important. Trying to cut corners and saying, oh, you know what? One time Tim sold something with a partner and I know he's the CTO, but we're thinking he'd make a good channel chief. Yeah. It is really not a good way to go about it. So I always tell everybody, get help, right? And if you can't afford yeah. a full-time channel chief, there's firms like mine and others who can serve as fractional channel chiefs for you. But that leadership is one of the most important things. The second thing is understanding what your routes to market are. So what routes to market do you Every solution is different, right? Are you going through a marketplace? Are you going to be sell to in a resale model? Are you going to be sell through in an agent model? Are you going to be sell with in a co-sell model? What are the routes to market that are going to work for your customers? 
And what are the costs inherent in those and the support inherent in those and the people you need and the programs that you need? What does that look like? Falling out of love with the rear view mirror staffing of things and actually having a plan for how you're going to, you're going to have not only your program, but how your program is going to be supported. And and then I would say the third thing is really mapping then that partner experience, right? What is the partner experience? What is a partner, whether they're an influencer, a non-transacting partner, a transacting partner, whatever those models are that you support, what is their experience going to be and how do you make it as simple as possible? And then as a company, if you already have a channel, do the simple thing first. Do the simplest thing first you can do for the biggest impact. Prove to the channel you're doing something. I always like to use examples. And as at Verizon, we just couldn't get out of our own ways with commission. And it was always wrong. And the partner would submit a commission change. Hey, you guys are wrong. And we'd research it for 60 days. And 99.9 times out of 100, the partner was always right. And so I finally just said to our CFO, like, what if we just let them tell us what we owe them? And then we'll audit it. Wouldn't that be better? Like simple thing to do, biggest impact, because they all hate us because their checks are always late. And we signed off on that and our partner satisfaction went through the roof. And it was a simple thing to do for the biggest impact. So that, that's kind of the final thing I always tell people. Once you've decided what your channel strategy is, you want your program to look like, you're not a metal triangle thing, right? We're in a more circular world now, a little more interdependency than that. And then go just make a list of the stuff because everybody comes up with a hundred things and then just prioritize them. What's the smallest thing I could do for the biggest impact? Just do that. Just like do that. The partners are pretty understanding. And if you start delivering some benefit to them, they're going to, it's going to go a lot farther for you to make changes that you need. You're going to get a lot more open and honest dialogue. We tend to try to, I don't want to use the term game things, but we try to overcomplicate things. Yeah. Layer in technology. uh, Like, why do I need to have to go to this site to pull down your data sheets? and register a deal. Can we make this easier? And then go to this other site and do this. And then, oh, wait, hang on. I got to spin around three times, chew the gum five minutes, and then hop on a foot and then put it in the other system. What we do to our partners, we would never do to our people. Exactly. That's always my kind of anthem. Would you do this to your own people? You struck a chord on the talent matters and the leadership discussion too. And so many times I find that people, and I This is firsthand, right? Having led channel organizations and an organization at Microsoft for a decade, they were, we like them. They weren't as good in sales, but with people like them, customers like them. So we're going to move them over here to the channel team, (laughs) right? Like they're underperformers. They're underperformers and you want me to take them on. I want the top sellers in my channel or my partner organization. And should have the top people because the channel, quite frankly, as this megacosm gets bigger and bigger and bigger, it also gets unsustainable for a single brand. And what the vendors sometimes, and I'll just say vendors, you can call yourself whatever you want, provider, ISV, they forget, they lose track of this concept that when you walk in and you're representing ABC Co., you're representing ABC Co., that's all you can sell. When the partner walks in and represents ABC Co., the customer knows that the partner could sell anything. And they've chosen to represent you. So you must be the best of the best. And I think somehow we've lost a little bit of track of that. If the partner is perceived more positively by the customer, why you wouldn't have the best people in the partner community support teams, I don't get. And the complexity of you're not just managing a sales territory. You are managing a group of partners. You're managing business plans, build plans, exactly. co-selling plans, right? It's There's a right. lot more complexity. It's a there. complicated world. And then we always put the channel team a little bit on their back foot, or at least not good channel organizations, put them on their back foot of having to defend the channel all the time. And so great organizations get top talented people. They cease all of the practices that complicate their channel with the defend the channel moves, right? Overly complicated deal registration, overly complicated rules of engagement. They simplify stuff and say, look, we're comfortable with the channel being in the driver's seat and we're clear about it. And if we have blocked accounts or or, or anything else, we're clear about it. We communicate right up front. Hey, guess what? You can't sell to, right? Period, end of story. And, And they win fans and business because of it. The others who are innocuous and they have all this bluesy, bluesy language and you can't really even understand what their program is. And they're they're so complicated that you can't work through it. There's other options. People just are walking away from those folks. 
I love it. You've laid out a master class here. I'm, I can't wait to go back and transcribe this interview and, and put awesome. some of this out to the world. You, really, Janet, this is terrific. Thank you. I want to talk to you about, we talked about the technology stack a little bit. We touched on it and our good friend Jay is tracking it. So what do you think about all this partnership automation that's going on? And are we in fact going to see the same thing in the partner world that we saw in the marketing world with the evolution of that stack? I think so. Yeah, I think so. I think, listen, there's firms that are automating bad processes. And so then they blame the automation, which is just very silly. You have to get your process, you have to get your channel strategy right. You have to get things right. And then you pick the partner automation and tech stack that's working for you. Now, I think we're going to see more and more consolidation of particularly things like PRM systems. We're going to see more and more of a consolidation of those and new entrants that are saying, look, this kind of bifurcated way we've looked at partner relationship management has changed. And so in the, when the, in the megacosm or ecosystem, wherever your particular lens is on the industry, automating is a little more difficult, a little more challenging. And so we're seeing these kind of born in the cloud solutions now that, that were not brought up as pure PRM systems and are more about focusing on the end user customer outcome. And they're starting to take some hold and people are starting to use them. People are starting to implement them. So I think we're going to see not only a consolidation, but I think we're going to see some new solutions come into the market and surprise people with how simple they are for multiple partners to work a deal together. And that truly to me is the next level in this decade of the megacosm. What do you predict? Do you think it'll be stitching together a bunch of point solutions to solve or an Uber best of breed solution? I think it's going to be right now a bunch of point solutions. Over time, somebody's going to consolidate those point solutions and put them in a single pane of glass Uber solution. But I don't think that happens quickly because if there's one thing the technology industry and the channel is, it's complicated. Yeah. I agree with you there as well. And I think that there'll be some, you pointed out consolidation, right? So I think there'll be opportunities for acquisition of some of these technologies over time. And that might be their strategy all along coming out. Yes, I agree. So this has been a fascinating conversation and I already am, I'm going to invite you back. We got to, cause there's so much more I want to talk to you about. We could spend hours and hours here. And Oh yeah. We got a lot to unpack you and I. Yeah. Yeah. But I want to save some of that for our next time together. And I also, I want to, focus on you and your career. As you might know, I'm fascinated with the career journey. I've been a big advocate for women in technology and an ally. And so I'd love for you to share with our listeners, like you have had an amazing career. When I look back at your LinkedIn, it's just prolific. Tell us more about your journey. And was there a pivot point or something that propelled you along the way to your success? So interesting. A couple things. I think there's never a straight answer. I went to school. I went to college for finance. I was going to trade euro dollars and work on Wall Street. And when I got there, it was hideous and I hated it. And so my boss at the time sent me to go to L'Oreal Lancome Cosmetics and work there in their marketing team. He said, hey, I know somebody uh-huh. there. I think you'd love it there. And while I was there... IBM came in, early day web sphere kind of stuff, and they just botched the presentation and I wasn't going to get what I needed. And so I helped them redo the presentation and they were a channel partner for IBM. and Thus, the channel career was born. What the propelling moment when I said this, the channel, this is for me, was truly then was seeing that this channel partner had the right solution, had the answers, knew our business. The thing I saw was they couldn't put it on paper. They couldn't present it. They went into geek speak. And so I spent my first round in the channel. I had my own consulting firm and really helped clients with their go-to-market, both partners and vendors of saying, what are you saying? No one understands you. And so that really just cemented my love of the channel and started working in channel programs and channel marketing, and then ultimately sold my first rendition of JS Group to Motorola as part of the whole symbol acquisition and went in there to lead their enterprise channel. And so that moment of saying, look at this, there is somebody that knows how to do what I as a business leader need, just made me fall in love with the channel. And I don't think it's ever changed. Now, that's kind of the high level, the lower level, and I always talk about women in leadership, has been at many times, it was a very lonely journey. I was the only woman in a meeting. I was the only woman at an event. I was the only woman speaker. I was the only woman leader. And so there were a lot of times where 
it was difficult to want to keep going because you didn't feel like you belonged. And I did feel like I belonged when I was at L'Oreal Lancome because there was a whole bunch of people like me, right? Females. And so it was difficult. And there were times where, and I always very honest about it, there were times where my husband, who's a lovely human and has also had a very great career, picked me up at the airport in, in tears. And I still remember he drove one night at one in the morning to pick me up and then drive me to my next thing, which was two hours away rather than a car service, because he just knew I was raw enough that I could make the wrong decision. And it was just, it was tough. And I, and I never want to lie to women that are listening to say, oh, look at her. She was so successful. She made it to the C-suite. She's on boards. She had a, just look at that amazing journey. It must've been so easy. She was so lucky. I wasn't lucky. I was a hard worker. I have thick skin and I wasn't afraid to have some tough conversations. And it still was lonely and very difficult. Was there a best piece of advice along the way? Yes. So some people don't know this, but I did a bunch of consulting for Intel and was adopted a little bit by Andy Grove, who gave me a lot of great advice. So I'm going to use Uh, this piece of advice. Yeah, he was fabulous, kind of a quasi mentor. And he said, the thing that always struck me was he said that you can't be afraid of your opinion, even when people tell you you're wrong. And while you don't want to be seen as somebody who overly stands your ground, don't let people push you off your ground too soon. And that was the statement. Don't let people push you off your ground too soon. You're right. Stick your ground. And in the channel, that couldn't be better advice because There's always somebody telling you you're wrong when you're the channel leader, always, whether it's your CFO, whether it's your the the head of sales, whether it's your partners, whatever it is, somebody's always telling you you're wrong and you got to stand your ground a little bit. And that's harder. I hate to say it, but it's true. It's harder for women than it is for guys. And so I hope that I've shown that and demonstrated that in my career and can serve as a role model to somebody who needs to stand their ground right now. Stand your ground. And Andy Grove. Wow. Only the paranoid survive. One of my That's right. Yeah. Yeah. He was a great, he was an amazing leader. So many great things came out of Intel, including OKRs, John Doerr's work as well. I want to have a little fun with you today. Okay. This is is like a favorite question of mine. I get to ask this almost all of my guests. So you're hosting a dinner party and you can invite any three guests to this amazing dinner party from the present or the past. And I don't know if you're going to host it here in beautiful Florida or up in beautiful New Jersey, where you are right now. Who would you invite? Whom would you invite to this party and why? So I always, when somebody asks me a question like this, I always want to go with the gut easy answer, right? Which would be my mom, my dad, my sister, because they, I've lost them all. And so it would be wonderful to have one more dinner with them. But that's not the fun answer. So my fun answer would be Darth Vader. Darth <laughs> Vader. That's a first Luke, for me. Yeah. Darth <laughs> Vader, Luke Skywalker, and Kylo Ren would be who I would. Of course, they're fictional characters, but those of you who know me know I'm a massive Star Wars fan. So I probably would look to do something like that. A, a Star Wars dinner would be my most fun dinner party and amazing because I'm such a Star Wars geek. I love it. I love it. It's so different than what I expected to hear from you today. But, See? And certainly you your go. mom. And certainly your mom, dad, and sister. I'd love to have them join as well. And I'm going to I'm gonna stop by. I would too. And my sister would be laughing at me, but my mom and dad were very tolerant of my sci-fi-ness. So. And I'll come by with a bottle of wine. Is that all right with you? What would you oh, like? Oh, it would be awesome. Red? Yeah, it would be awesome. That would be great. Terrific. Janet, you have been so amazing and so much fun to be with today. For our listeners, any closing advice? This is an important time for us in this channel and ecosystem world. Any advice for these wonderful listeners today? Now's the time to challenge your status quo. It's the time to not look in the rear view mirror and instead look in the front facing windshield and think about what needs to change. Change takes a long time in the ecosystem, the megacosm, in the channel, whatever you want to call it. Change takes time. And so you really need to step back, get some outside views, talk to Vince and I, we can both give you some outside views, get some outside views, consider what needs to change, consider what your bedrocks are that will never change and start executing on those changes that you cannot wait any longer for the changes that need to happen. I love what you had to say here. Janet, thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. As with each of my episodes, I appreciate your support. Please subscribe on your favorite platform, like, comment, Tell your friends about Ultimate Guide to Partnering and where they can find us. 
and I'd love your feedback. Please like the podcast and provide comments or reach out to me at Vince Menzion on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. You can also like and follow Ultimate Guide to Partnering on our Facebook page or drop me a line at vincem at ultimate-partnerships.com. This episode of the podcast is sponsored by PartnerTap the partner ecosystem platform most trusted by enterprise. Drive more revenue with your partners and learn more at partnertap.com. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of The Ultimate Guide to Partnering with your host, Vince Minzione. Online at ultimateguidetopartnering.com and facebook.com slash ultimateguidetopartnering. We'll catch you next time on The Ultimate Guide to Partnering.